All right, good afternoon, guys. I'm giving what I'm told is the last lecture of the day, and you've all eaten. So if you could stay awake and with me, that would be a job well done. That's all I expect. Um, so I'm going to be talking about sepsis, which I think I can get through pretty quickly because not much has changed in the last year or so. Um, but I think it's important for the interns. Is there mostly interns here? Or are there any interns here? Just the one, two, three? That's it? Well, this will go down a treat. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this, um, a little bit of background about sepsis, why it's so important for everybody, especially at U of L, and a little bit about the background of the disease, the syndrome that it's now associated, now otherwise called, and then more importantly, recognizing and treatment, because that's ultimately the most important thing. So sepsis is by no means a new phenomenon or a new sim syndrome or disease. It has been recognized since the beginning of time. So I put some quotes up here from way back in the day, essentially to highlight the fact that we recognized that there was always an invasion of the human body from other creatures or pathogens that caused the body to have an overwhelming reaction or response that we now recognize as sepsis, but even a very long time ago was recognized as pathologic and um, led to lots of death and mortality, morbidity. So as we have learned more about sepsis, we've obviously tailored our treatment approaches and recognition, which are the two most important things for sepsis. And so this is essentially sepsis through time, but most importantly for us clinically is the Surviving Sepsis Guidelines and Campaign, which all kicked off around 2004. So in 2004, or just prior to that, there was a lot of interest, a lot of studies being done in sepsis. What causes it? How do we recognize it? How do we treat it? And how do we improve patient outcomes? And so once they had enough of this data, they released guidelines. So in 2004 was the first set of real guidelines that came out, just defining what sepsis is, how to um, recognize it clinically, and maybe some recommendations on treatment. And then over the last several years, these Guidelines have been revised most recently in 2017, 16, 17, the latest revisions came out. Um, it's important to understand the context from the first set of the guidelines to the most recent ones because the evolution is important and the most recent guidelines are obviously what we use clinically, but it's important to know where they came from and why we do what we do. So some background as to why sepsis is so important and why... I, personally, and a lot of us here harp on about it and the importance of recognizing it. So it remains, a, we're calling it now a syndrome but, or a disease, but it remains something that um, has such a high incidence and prevalence and the mortality associated with sepsis is on the rise. So if you compare this to other diseases uh, which are considered medical emergencies such as an MI, so a STEMI, or a uh, code stroke, all of those diseases are actually either on their way down or the treatment has gotten so good that we recognize it earlier and patients have better outcomes. That is not the case with sepsis. It continues to be on the rise and death associated with sepsis continues to be on the rise. So that's why, um, from a medicine perspective, we're really trying to give sepsis the same limelight that these other medical emergencies receive. Um, now, pathogens that are associated with sepsis have changed and have been evolving over time. Um, bacterial, gram-positive bacterial infections remain the most common, but essentially bacterial infections are the most common cause of sepsis. But fungal infections are also on the rise, and that is partly because of um, uh, people who have a low immune system are living longer, surviving through more things, and so we're recognizing this disease or syndrome in this patient population. Um, there's also a lot more immunocompromised patients out and about, and so um, fungal infections are becoming more prevalent. So just to give you some context, about 1.5 million people are diagnosed with sepsis each year in the United States. About 250,000 of these will die, and that is up there with heart disease and strokes and cancers. One in three patients will die in the who die in the hospital will die of sepsis. And I'm sure you guys see this on wards all the time, and you definitely see it in the ICU. Most of the patients who are septic, it is from outside of the hospital. So most patients come in through the ED with sepsis. That's what brings them in. And then what happens in the hospital is just as important, obviously. But most of your septic patients were septic from the outpatient setting. It was either not recognized or not appropriately treated from their physicians and then ultimately got worse and they came in. 
And the remaining is inpatient sepsis. So, <clears throat> excuse me, patients who have been in the hospital for a long time who have developed a hospital-acquired infection or a complication from another infection. Um, and that is also true to you, Avel. So we're a little, we're pretty close. We have our septic patients, about 70% of ours come through the ED. We have a slightly higher than um, we would like rate of in-hospital sepsis, but that's a whole other problem. <laughs> um, and just so you know, the most common source of infection is pneumonia. So its most common cause of sepsis is usually in the lungs. Whether it's a community or hospital-acquired pneumonia or an aspiration pneumonia, the lungs are the most common source, followed by UTI, sepsis from UTI. And then other things, cellulitis, skin infections, GI infections, those sorts of things are common but not as common. So as I talked about, it's the third most common cause of death. So it is a huge problem, both for the country and for you as clinicians dealing with patients on a day-to-day. -day. The death rate from sepsis equals that of, N of MIs. MIs currently on their way down, let's say, or recognition, obviously, of an MI is done much more frequently and with ease compared to sepsis. In the ICU, it's the leading cause of death. So those of you that have been in the ICU already see that for the most part, it's a fellowship in sepsis with a few other things that we do. Um, and just to make it relevant from a clinical perspective, it's also a very costly syndrome. And a lot of that is because it's not appropriately recognized early on. Okay. So the initial surviving sepsis campaign guidelines came out, it categorized sepsis or um, infections in this way, starting off with plain old infection and moving all the way over to septic shock. So it's sort of a spectrum, starting off with an infection that perhaps then causes systemic problems and ends up in shock. So you have to be able to recognize these various symptoms along that spectrum in order to prevent patients from getting worse and moving down that spectrum. So first off, it starts off with infection. And I think it's important to recognize, and we'll kind of talk about this a little bit later, but having an infection is not the same as being septic. You can have an infection with any pathogen, viral organism, and not be septic. Once you are septic, that's pretty different, and that actually moves you to a different category, as we can see, and that therefore changes your mortality and morbidity. So you can have somebody that has positive cultures but is not septic, or you can see somebody in the clinic that has an infiltrate on chest x-ray but they're not septic. So I think it's important to make the distinction, especially on wards when you guys are rounding. If you're seeing patients who have an infection, it doesn't mean that they're septic. So to be septic, they have to meet certain criteria. And that criteria is that they have to have SERS criteria plus a source of infection. Those, that combination means your patient is septic. Now, it doesn't take a lot to be septic, but it's an important distinction to make, especially from, um, from a documentation perspective, which I know is not everybody's favorite. But if you document somebody is septic, then you've attached a specific mortality to that patient. If you just say they have an infection, it's different. Likewise, if you admit a patient and say they have an infection and they die two days later, something's gone horribly wrong. So you really have to try and make the distinction between a person who has an infection, secondary to pneumonia or UTI, versus a patient who is septic. Um, so to have a source of infection plus SERS criteria, which we'll talk about, puts you at septic. To then have severe sepsis, you have to have organ dysfunction, and it can be any organ, so not necessarily the organ that is causing the infection. And then from there, you can have septic shock, which is exactly that. You are now in shock despite being resuscitated. So you have to have given the patient resuscitation. They continue to be hypotensive, and that is called septic shock. So this is a pretty good model that basically shows you start up at the bottom. You can have SERS criteria and not have an infection, or you can have an infection and not have SERS criteria. And the combination of the two moves you into sepsis, and so on and so forth, up until you get to septic shock. As you're moving up, your severity of illness obviously goes up, and your chances of organ dysfunction is also rising. Okay, so for the handful of interns in the room, who, which one of you knows which one is SERS criteria? So A, B, C, or D. I'm going to let you read it yourself on account of you can do that. Correct, it is C. <laughs> okay, so your SERS criteria. It's important to... Um, 
to know what your search criteria are because um, it's used as a really quick and fairly good screening tool. Um, it's typically now recommended that the ED uses it more than inpatient um, sepsis diagnosis, but it's a very helpful tool. So essentially it is looking, you have to have two of the following. So you have to have a temperature above 38 or 100.4 or below 36. You have to have a heart rate above 90, breathing rate above 20, and a white count greater than 12 or less than 4 or 10% bands. So the 10% bands often gets forgotten, but that's an important distinction to make as well. So any two of those and you have SIRS. So if you have SIRS, do you have an infection? Not all at once, please, just one at a time. No, okay. <laughs> so what else could give you SIRS but not give you an infection? Yes, so traumas, yep, traumas, burns, seizures, um, other types of shock, all of those things will give you those two at least of those without you truly having an infection. If you think about what we do clinically, most of those patients are getting put on antibiotic right as they come through the door, which again, it's why it's important to make that distinction. Are they truly septic? or do they just have a response to something that's happened to them? So this is um, other things that can cause SIRS um, that is not an infection. So we've moved up now. I'm going to talk a little bit more about sepsis. So once you have an infection source plus the SIRS criteria, you have sepsis. It's not retired by any means. It's used in the ED more, so we think it has better sensitivity and specificity for ED patients but when medical teams such as ourselves are assessing patients, like the second assessment, which we'll talk about, we've moved towards the QSOFA. But the SIRS is definitely still part of the initial screening. And you cannot prize SIRS um, criteria out of other specialists, so you can't make BMT stop using it, you can't make trauma stop using it, and other surgeons. So it's still very heavily used, but it is, we are shifting towards other um, scoring systems, depending on the patient's. Um, so let's talk about the combination of the two, therefore, sepsis moving towards severe sepsis and septic shock. So remember, this is talking about the first consensus guidelines that came out. So they have evolved and they have changed. So in fact, severe sepsis, which I am going to talk about today because I think it's important for you to know about it clinically and historically, but severe sepsis we've also moved away from. There's no real such thing as severe sepsis. You are either... SERS E, septic, or in shock. But again, not everybody is as aware of some of these changes, and so you'll get a lot of people telling you that they have severe sepsis. And essentially, severe sepsis is evidence of organ dysfunction or other organ dysfunction. So if you have somebody who has an infection plus their SERS criteria, and they have a um, mildly increased troponin, or their LFTs are a little bumped, or their creatinine is a little high. That is evidence of end organ damage or dysfunction to put you into the severe sepsis category. And we see that all the time. It's very common. Um, and so you have to kind of recognize that now this infection is starting to have a more global impact on the patient's health. And perhaps the reason we've moved away from severe sepsis is that we're trying to recognize that right there as end organ dysfunction as they're moving towards shock and treating it sooner. But that is historically what severe sepsis was. And so the ED would often call you and say, I have a patient in severe sepsis. It meant there is evidence of other organ damage. And then we move to shock, which is where you don't want your patient to get to. The whole point of recognizing this early is to prevent your patient from moving towards septic shock. And this is persistent or refractory hypotension despite adequate fluid resuscitation. And I'm going to highlight the word adequate here because giving somebody a 500 cc bolus is not adequate. So you really have to have given them their appropriate fluid bolus and they've not improved to be septic shock. From an ICU perspective, um, we feel that septic shock should obviously be in the ICU because they require aggressive treatment, but we strongly, and me in particular, feel that they have to have gotten resuscitated. And often the ED has not done that, right? They call you because they're in shock. They want them in the unit. But you have to have been appropriately resuscitated, still be in shock. That means that you need aggressive critical treatment. So this is what we were talking about, the Q-SOFA versus the SERS criteria. So when you 
apply the SIRS criteria to your patients, you're going to get in that subset of patients people who have SIRS but do not have an infection like we talked about. And so when you've initially screened them, we go back when we are assessing patients in the ED or who have come up to the floor with a Q-SOFA. And we do that to then try and find those patients that have a true infection in that subset of patients. The QSOFA is much better at identifying patients who have a true infection in SIRS, so sepsis, versus those who just have a positive SIRS. So um, which one of these is the QSOFA criteria? Anybody? One, two, or three? Okay. Two, okay, good job. These are just easy questions, yes. Um, so two. So if you look at these, almost all your patients are going to meet this criteria, right? I, I mean, I'm sure you guys are down in the ED all the time. A rate above 22, altered, and a blood pressure less than 100. It's almost everybody you get caught for, right? So um, this is helpful. So when we use it is once a person has met SIRS criteria, we're trying to tease out if they have a true underlying infection. So we've moved from the first set of the sepsis guidelines over now to this second set or the next um, sep surviving sepsis campaign. Um, and they changed the definition a little bit based on what we now have as good data and many clinical trials. And they changed this life-threatening organ dysfunction, so what was severe sepsis that we've moved away from. And that is because over the last 15 years, there's been a lot of studies and research and well thought out clinical trials that have gotten us to this set of um, definitions. And so now sepsis, rather than being a disease, is considered a syndrome. So the infection or the pathogen that um, gets into your body is not the problem. It's how you, the host, react to that pathogen. And everybody has differing reactions. And so the extent to which your body um, puts together an immune response to fight this infection will determine how sick you will get. So it's a syndrome. And so we now look at various markers to identify infections, sepsis, levels of sepsis, so to speak. And these markers are all associated with um, infection, sepsis, septic patients. The one that we most notably use, I don't know if this works, as you all know, is the procalcitonin. We rely quite heavily on that. But all of these markers are abnormal in patients who have an infection, which is basically going to show that this is a systemic reaction. Your body is reacting to an invasion from an organism or a pathogen. And so they've also, they elevated the status of the sepsis syndrome from essentially not anything significant, to a medical emergency. So at some point in the future, you could imagine this being a, a code sepsis, and I guess in our case, in the current tense. But um, just like you get a code stroke or a code STEMI, you should theoretically be getting a code sepsis. As I'll move on to talk about, there are very specific ways to treat this, and there are timelines that you have to hit both for treatment and for recognition. So you could almost imagine this being the case, except that because it is so common and prevalent, it would be going off all of the time. And so we're trying, they're still trying to find ways to be more sensitive and specific, but this has now been elevated to the same status as these other medical emergencies. And so where did we get all of this information from? So um, back in the early 2000s, this was a landmark trial by Rivers who was one of the first people to really start the early goal-directed therapy and basically bundle care for patients with sepsis. And what he and his team did was try and find ways to treat patients with sepsis and septic shock to try and improve outcomes. And they focused on various different things throughout the protocol that they put together. So the first thing they did was to try and aim for a specific CVP map and an SCVO2, basically trying to make sure that the patient is well perfused, either with fluids, blood products, whatever they could, to get the blood pressure up. Because if you can keep their pressure up, you're perfusing the organs and hopefully preventing any end organ damage. So they were aiming for CVPs, they were aiming for MAPs, and they were aiming for a mixed venous. And depending on what numbers they were getting for these would depend on the treatment that they would give those patients. So at the end of the trial, they were recommending that you put in a central line for all of your septic patients and you measure a, essentially a mixed venous and that you give um, 
you use that also for a CVP and that you give fluid and or blood products to help keep your MAP above 65 and to help keep your SCVO2 high enough, you would give blood products. And then you'd use pressors early, so either dopamine or other pressors to help keep your blood pressure up. And that essentially became the standard of care for 15 years or so. And it was associated with improved outcome and mortality in these patients. And the study essentially was one of the landmark trials to help us introduce a very stringent way of approaching the septic patient, and it's very algorithmic. The goal was to correct any hypovolemia, any hypotension, and in some cases, and in cases to help um, prevent end organ damage. And these concepts are the same that we're still using today. It's just the way that we go about measuring some of these things has changed, and we've changed some of the limits that we're aiming for. Essentially, uh, about 10 to 15 years later, we redid a lot of this trial again. We did the trial in similar ways. And these three trials came out. One was here, one was back in England, and one was in Australia. And they used what was standard of care versus um, early goal directed therapy. So the kind of stuff that Rivers was doing. And they found no difference 15 years later. But what you should remember is that um, standard of care from 15 years ago is completely different to standard of care now because now we know that blood pressure is important, that pressors are important, that checking these things are important. So the reason we think there's no difference is because most people are getting what is standard of care that they were not getting back in the early 2000s. Um, but this essentially changed a little bit about what we do now in practice. And so following these big trials is what led to the most recent uh, surviving sepsis guidelines. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about those and why they're so important to do, but also why they're so difficult to do. So if you are called down to the ER to see your patient, um, the ED has done half of what they're meant to. So they've got some labs for you and the patient is clearly septic and perhaps um, heading towards shock, these are the things that you want to be going through. And the single most important thing for the septic patient is what? Okay, it's antibiotics. So it's antibiotics every single time for every single patient, no exceptions, no waiting and seeing, no nothing. It's antibiotics. It's your number one, two, three thing to do <laughs> for every patient. And I understand it's difficult both logistically and just to get down there to see the patients, but it's the single intervention that correlates with improved outcomes. So it's antibiotics. And then you can worry about fluids, which is your second most important thing. Okay. So the latest sepsis guidelines came out in bundles. There is a three-hour bundle and a six-hour bundle. And at the very end, I'm going to talk about a one-hour bundle because now it's a one-hour bundle. <laughs> And that is from t the time the patient enters the hospital. So realistically, a one-hour bundle is going to fall on your ED. Um, but if you're getting called for an inpatient, then you need to get these patients seen very quickly. But your three-hour bundle. So the first thing you want to make sure happens, and again, a lot of this should be happening in the ED, but um, it doesn't. So you need to make sure that you're checking for these things. So the first thing is blood cultures before antibiotic therapy. You want to know what organism, if any, your patient has. You want to measure a baseline serum lactic acid. That is very important, and it is one of the bundle measures. You want to give antibiotics. I guess that one should have come before measuring the lactic acid, but you want to give antibiotics as soon as you've drawn blood cultures, and you want to measure your patient's lactic acid. And you want to give fluids, and we recommend 30 ml per kilogram um, of crystalloid fluid for almost everybody, but definitely hypotensive patients or patients with a lactic above four. Now, to unpack this a little bit, um, if your patient is 600 pounds, <laughs> you don't want to give them that much fluid, right? It's, per, it's for your ideal body weight. So just be aware of that. And if your patient has an EF of 10%, this rule still applies, if they are um, EF of 10% and they've got low extremity edema and they're on five liters of oxygen, this rule still applies, okay? So that's one of the biggest things that we see 
in it, this institution is that they are getting conservative fluid resuscitation of 500 cc bolus. The ED is banging them straight onto a presser, and so they, they don't get any fluid resuscitation. But this rule applies. If they can take it, and most patients can, they need to get their fluids in. Um, I've had some of our uh, ER residents um, hang their hat on expecting their answer to be they still need it. In fact, all their lactates only 2.8. They don't they don't need the 30 mil per people, and they've given a liter total, which for any of us is not going to be. So I have been default in still encouraging them to can I at least get thousand mils. I presume even with a less than four. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so less than four, it's still encouraged. Hypotension, it's obviously encouraged. End organ damage, it's still encouraged because this is, it's the beginning of a slippery slope down. Now, it's much easier said than done clinically. It's really hard to get physicians to give fluids to a patient that looks so clearly fluid overloaded or is hypoxic or has a low EF. And there is, and I'll talk about some literature that warns against too much fluid, which is also very important. But historically, um, we were giving patients, you know, five, six, seven, eight liters. And that, we don't do that anymore. That's not appropriate. But the 30 mLs per kg is, is um, tailored to that patient's weight and abilities and so should be perfectly safe. Now, the latest guidelines and guidelines in general recommend that you are constantly monitoring your patients. So if they are going to need three and a half liters and you're two liters in and suddenly they went from five liters to 12 liters, that's different, right? You may want to cut back and reevaluate some things. Um, but the recommendation is to give the entirety of what they should be getting when they should be getting it. And the sooner the better to prevent some of this stuff. And then obviously I'm biased, but from an ICU perspective, you would be surprised how many patients then don't need to come to the ICU because they got the extra liter and everything got better and they can they can go or they can not come to us essentially. Um, but that's just my own personal thing. <laughs> okay, so from the three hour bundle, so that's your first three hours, right? Patient comes in, cultures, antibiotics, check a lactic, give them some fluids. In an ideal world, that's the ED's job, right? Now the ED is picking up the phone and calling you. I know realistically that's not what happens, but you're getting the call now after all this stuff's been done. So you are the six-hour bundle team. And so what you want to be assessing for is fluid responsiveness. Did they respond to fluids? Because if they did, then if they did not, sorry, then your treatment is going to completely change. And so if you did not, then we're recommending vasopressor support for persistent hypotension. So that is a map less than 65 despite aggressive fluids. We recommend measuring CVP and SCVO2. This really doesn't happen. Or the repeat lactic acid, which should be happening. So after you've done your initial set of treatments, you want to get a repeat lactic acid. If your lactic acid is coming down, your patient should be on the mend. If not, then you need to revisit what you're doing. Um, CVP and SCVO2. So these guidelines are the second set. The most recent set, this is still part of the bundle, but we're moving towards more dynamic measures of blood pressure, which you guys will know about and do. Um, what you have to do is a physical exam, and you have to see if they responded to fluid. So if they still look clinically dry, you can go above that amount of fluid. Um, if they're not, then you obviously will change your treatment, but you have to do a physical exam. Those of you that were part of the sepsis team know that the physical exam was very important. You have to document your physical exam. So the one-hour bundle, which is essentially impossible to do, but it basically um, is saying that you need to do everything in the three-hour bundle in one hour. <laughs> so when the patient comes through the door, and as soon as you see them, you want to do everything, which is... Um, get your cultures, give the antibiotics, measure the lactic, and give them their fluids within one hour. I've yet to see that happen uh, anywhere, but it, I believe it's the recommendation. And even presses. So I'm not sure how you would get your fluid in within an hour, remeasure everything, and decide if they need presses, but um, you have around an hour to do that. And the reason is um, that, well, let's ask the question first. So if you're if you come in through the door and your lactic acid above two, what is your mortality in hospital mortality? A, B, C, D. Yeah, it's a real stumper. It's 25, right? So your, ch your chances of 
mortality with a lactic acid above 2 is 25. And I think I've told this to some of the um, residents and interns that I've worked with. If you need a vasopressor, it's 30%. If you are having a high lactic acid, hypotension, and on pressors, it goes up to 42% mortality, which is extremely high for something that is preventable, very preventable. For every hour that you do not administer antibiotics, your survival decreases by almost 8%. So if you just imagine going from a one hour to the three hour bundle, that will change your mortality, and from the three to the six. And just to give you guys some context, UofL has a time to antibiotics of about 9 to 13 hours. So we are not where we would like to be. It's getting better. It's gotten better. But prior to pretty recently, all those hours, that's mortality that is clocking away. Okay, so antibiotics, what should you give? Should you give one? Should you give three? Um, the latest recommendations are that you should give the antibiotics that are appropriate to the patient's source. So the patient comes in with a pneumonia, you should give them an antibiotic for that. If it's for cellulitis, you should give them for that. If they have risk factors such as healthcare-associated infections, you can tag on a second in, um, antibiotic. But if you don't know, which is what we typically do, you put them on broad-spectrum antibiotics and then you de-escalate at the earliest possible time. So it's a very strong recommendation for antibiotics very early and broad spectrum if you need them. Double coverage for organisms that you think are uh, the patient may have if they have resistant organisms, etc. Culture. So you culture anything and everything you can. Okay. So blood, urine, sputum, chest X-ray is your staple. But if they have a source that is outside of that, so a skin infection, for example, a bone infection, if you can culture it, biopsy it, you should to try and understand the offending organism so that you can tailor your antibiotics and ultimately de-escalate. The other thing that you want to do is control the source of infection, which is a little harder to do. Um, so if, um, if your patient has an abscess, for example, that is an intra-abdominal or a pelvic abscess or something like that, you really need to have somebody come and drain that or um, remove it or remove the source because you can do all of these bundles. If the source remains, you're not going to win that battle. Um, and that also goes for patients who have indwelling catheters or ports or those sorts of things. They have to come out in order to get control of your um, infection. You want to narrow the antibiotics as soon as you have evidence of that organism. So as soon as you know what it is and the sensitivities for it, you want to drop the other antibiotics. Patients do not survive more if you keep them on more antibiotics for longer. It's just not the way that it works. And obviously, how long you treat depends on the underlying infection. But it's about 7 to 10 days for most things. Um, obviously, in our patient population, endocarditis is a little different and bone infections, etc., a little different. But it's about 7 to 10 days. We recommend assessing the antibiotics daily and de-escalating them. So if it's not being addressed on rounds, make sure you're bringing it up and saying, hey, this person's on day seven of all three antibiotics. We need to think about de-escalating. And then the procalcitonin. Um, people either love or hate procalcitonin. In the ICU, we like it a lot. It should never be used on its own. It is not a diagnostic um, marker. You cannot get a high procalcitonin and say this person is septic or has an infection. But... It helps you with other clinical um, aspects. So if they have SIRS and they have an infection and you're worried about them then and their procal is high, then that goes with the clinical picture of an infection. If all of their other markers are normal and they have an isolated high procal serotonin, we don't really know what that means at this point, and so we don't recommend throwing all of this stuff at those patients. What it is very helpful for is de-escalating. So as your procalcitonin comes down, that is an indication that your infection has improved or is improving, and you can stop antibiotics once it gets low enough. The other thing it's very helpful for for the inpatient side of things is if a patient was admitted with an infection that you were treating and they improved, and then suddenly their procalcitonin starts going back up again, you worry about a hospital-acquired infection. So that might prompt you to think, better we culture them again or I better check some of these other labs and make sure that they're not also um, going towards an infection. So it's helpful in conjunction with other clinical signs and symptoms, but it should not be used in isolation. And then fluids. So if your patient needs fluids, what are you reaching for, ordering, I should say, or what should you not be reaching for, as the question asks? 
it's probably a redundant question because I've not seen this stuff starch for a long time. But once upon a time, it was used. And the reason I think it's important to remember is because it has been studied. These fluids have been studied, and it's changed even in the last four to five years. But what you don't want to use is starch, should you ever find that on your electronic health um, system. That is associated with worse outcomes. So if you pummel your patient with starch, they won't do well. Um, albumin is a very gray area fluid. So if you've given somebody the appropriate fluids, your 30 mLs, and they just don't look like they, they look like they need more, they've not quite been resuscitated, but you're worried about your heart failure patient or these other patients, then you can use albumin to help bridge them through that gap. It can be very helpful and something that you don't want to overload with a lot of volume, but it generally is not your go-to for hypotension related to sepsis. Um, you will see it used in other diseases and other forms of hypovolemia and shock, but it's generally not advised as your initial volume um, fluid in septic patients. So we talked about your 30 mLs. It's typically crystalloid. Um, it's lactate or it's normal saline. Most of, most of us have moved towards lactate now um, just because of the um, kidney um, associations with improved kidney outcome. But to be fair, they're both very... Um, similar and can be used. Um, and then, like I said, if you need to keep giving a lot more fluids, you can think about things like albumin, but not starch. Um, we talked a little bit about that. Okay, and then pressors. So you've tried that, you've given your 30, the patient is still in shock, MAP is 55, 60, you need to pick a presser, their heart rate is 86. Which one are you going for? No rapi. Okay. So you put them on norepi, and now they're maxed, and their heart rate is the same, 90, and their MAP is 60. Okay. Good job. Okay. So um, this has also changed. So it used to be that there were different pressers for different diseases, and it made the ICU all very exciting and elitist, and now it's not the case, right? It's norepinephrine for everybody, <laughs> so basically anybody could do it. Um, so you basically want to use norepinephrine for all forms of shock initially, but for septic shock particularly. And then your second line is vasopressin or epinephrine. And we usually will use um, vasopressin, um, depending on how sick they are, but we usually will go with vasopressin next, and that helps you to lower the dose of norepinephrine that is needed to maintain their MAP and hopefully reduce some of the complications that norepinephrine gives you, such as tachycardia, some ischemia, some cardiac problems. Um, but epinephrine is also a very good second line. The point of that question is that we don't use dopamine anymore. So dopamine was originally in the initial trials and was um, very strongly used, but we don't use dopamine. It's, it's dropped all the way down to like third or fourth line pressors. Um, for almost all diseases, but particularly for sepsis, it's associated with tachyarrhythmias, MIs, and, and other cardiac complications. So um, the, we talked about moving towards dynamic fluid resuscitation monitoring versus static. So when the initial trial came out, we were putting in central lines, measuring CVP, checking skin turgor to see how things were going. Um, now we're moving towards um, dynamic measurements, which I will say this institution does do very well. And when I say dynamic, we are talking about um, ultrasound. So you want to look at their IVC. If you gave them 30 mLs and their IVC is still collapsing, then you give them more. If their IVC is plump, they are no longer in need of fluids and you want to move towards um, presses. And so I guess in those instances, like you're asking about heart failure and with your other um, faculty who are in the ED, if you did give a liter or two liters and it's a little shy of the 30, if you ultrasounded them and they had a plump IVC, then you're probably okay to not give the full 30, but you have to have objective evidence that they, have, they are already fluid up or resuscitated. Other things that we do is if they have an A-line, we measure um, their pulse pressure variation. So you want to see ch if you have a variation in their A-line um, waveform with breathing in and out. That indicates they are dry, right, because they're intravascularly depleted. Um, 
You can do a passive leg raise. In fact, I don't know if Tice is here, but he did one the other day in, uh, on rounds, which not many people do them, but he did. If you lift up somebody's legs for a couple of minutes, um, you have about 500 cc's of fluid in your legs. So if you lift their legs up, it's like a 500 cc bolus. So if you notice that when you do that, their blood pressure comes up, then that means they are still fluid responsive and you want to keep giving them fluids. If you lift their legs up and you have to hold it there for a few minutes and nothing happens, then they don't need fluids anymore. So these are dynamic measurements that we do in the ICU. We're moving away from a CVP. And you should be aware that CVP has fallen very much out of favor in almost all areas. Um, I know the cardiologists and hepatologists will not like that, but it's very, very unreliable for volume status. So we really don't use it for um, monitoring volume status anymore. Um, steroids. So you do not use steroids in septic shock right off the bat. You have to have a patient that had refractory hypotension, so shock was volume resuscitated, is on presses, and is now requiring escalating doses of presses, then you can add corticosteroids. And it's typically hydrocortisone broken up into 50 milligrams to a total of 200. Um, but it's not something that you're doing straight off um, upon admission. You have to actually have failed other therapies. And then there's some recommendation that it could help. It does not change your patient's mortality. It just helps their blood pressure. And that might buy you time for the antibiotics to do their job, but it doesn't in and of itself help improve overall outcome. And then lactic acid. So um, obviously you should measure it at the beginning and then measure it post-resuscitation. You should measure your lactic acid until it normalizes. So we see quite commonly that a person came in with a lactic of 12, then they checked it again and it was six, and then it was never checked again. But as you remember, a lactic acid of above four is almost a 50% mortality. So you wanna check it till it's good. Um, and the other thing you want to remember is your lactic acid is a helpful marker of hypoperfusion. So if it's high and staying high, something is not being perfused, and that is a problem. Um, and then your clearance is just as important. They don't talk about it as much, but your lactic acid clearance. So a patient who has a lactic acid of 12 that drops to 6 is doing better than a patient that has lactic acid of 5 that drops to 4 after the same amount of fluids, right? Because it means you're making lactic acid or you're not clearing it at an adequate rate. And so that patient is technically sicker than the one that's clearing it. Um, and that's important to monitor because if your lactic acid is not getting better, that person needs their perfusion figured out, either more fluids, more presses, um, but it's a, it's a marker of a poor prognosis or not doing well. Okay, so just so you remember, you want to recognize your septic patient early, right? Whether you're using CERT or QSOFA is, is fine, but you want to, it's better to capture too many patients and overtreat than undertreat this syndrome. So recognize them early and think about it in the same way you would react if you were called for a STEMI or a stroke. Um, because like I mentioned, this is on the increase. Um, dynamic changes when you're measuring for fluid responsiveness are very um, highly recommended, more so than um, static. And that's important. And it's easier to do in the ICU, but it's important to do that with all of the patients that you're seeing. Okay, so you talk a little bit about bundles. And I promise you the sepsis response team is good and dead. Um, but the, the bundle care is still very important. Um, so they've looked at giving, approaching a septic patient with bundles. Um, so it's just meaning an algorithmic approach. So following an algorithm versus not. And if you follow an algorithm or a bundle, your patients do better. It allows for earlier recognition and earlier treatment and better outcomes. And it should be the standard of care. So they have looked at this. They've studied it. Patients who are getting hospitals that have bundles in their electronic health record or sepsis teams or a sepsis nurse or a help team that goes around recognizing and treating these patients earlier, these patients do do better. The odds ratio of them dying from sepsis is less because of bundled care. Um, so I'm going to talk about sepsis projects, I promise. But I just wanted you to know why this is so important. Aside from the, the global approach to sepsis in the states as a whole, at UofL, as I've mentioned, our numbers are not great. Um, 
those of you who are new, we did have a sepsis response team. People still have PTSD from it because it went off a lot. But, <laughs> but it did help. And so I, I think it's important for you guys to know that the effort that was made in that year really improved the outcomes at U of L. So when we started the project, um, I guess it was a year and a half ago, the expected to observe mortality, which is essentially if a patient comes in septic, um, you are expecting them to die or not and what is actually happening. So we, are not, we should not be expecting patients to die from regular infection or even severe sepsis. What we were having was they were dying at twice the rate they should have done here. And at the end of the 18 months, so our compliance with bundles was um, somewhere in the range of 32 to 34 percent, so pretty low. At the end of the 18 months, it was up to 94 percent. Our mortality dropped significantly in the last year, um, and patients hit almost every bundle marker for the patients that were being called for versus the ones that we were not being called for. So it makes a huge difference, just further solidifying that bundled care really does work. This is us before, and if you're interested, I can send you the after, but the very big, very tall blue bar is um, no, which means we were not doing all of these things. Um, so we have the biggest, bluest bar. Um, but if you, at least we have some yeses, we were doing things in red. So if you compare us to like trauma or neurosurgery or even cardiology, we were doing pretty well. But given that we are medicine and given that this is, especially from an ICU perspective, this is all that we do, we would expect our recognition of this to be way better. The thing that we miss most commonly is the initial lactic acid. And I think that's much more missed on the inpatient sides of things versus coming through the ED. Um, but we were missing antibiotics pretty significantly. Um, and again, it wasn't always us. Maybe the ED wasn't ordering it or there was a confusion as to who was. But we were missing some pretty crucial elements. Okay, so I feel like I've mentioned most of these things. Um, yep, so identify your patient early recognize that they are sepsic, that they have an infection, that they could escalate to sepsis and septic shock. Um, get your bundles in quickly. The three-hour one, if you're being called from an inpatient side of things for one of your ward patients, get those things done early and quickly and antibiotics up front, and we can always de-escalate later. Okay, questions? Yep. Is there any better idea when they did the big retrospectives in 2017 that showed, like, the bundle mortality perfectly of your antibiotics, but then when they did the subset analysis, it didn't show any mortality benefit for flu, as long as they got an intake. As long as they got an intake. Yes. Is there any idea why that is? Like, you see people perk up as in physiological things. Yeah, I think it's because, so um, when you're giving fluids, it's technically a temporizing measure. You're giving your fluids and assuming that you are recognizing and treating that infection quickly with antibiotics. Um, as we talked about sepsis being a syndrome, it's such, it can be such a overwhelming response from your body that the degree of vasodilation and chemotoxins from the pathogens are so severe that you can quote unquote burn through that fluid pretty quickly and keep requiring more. Vasopressors are obviously helpful at normalizing your blood pressure, but they are not correcting the underlying physiological, what we now believe is an inflammatory response against the organism or the invader. And so I, they think that that's what the physiological reason is, but we don't have a good idea. I think about five to 10 years ago, it was in fact the other way. Fluids were the most important thing in sepsis. So you used to have to get down to the ED and pummel them with fluids and some antibiotics. Um, but we recognize that actually the more fluids you give above the 30, the worse they do outcomes. Um, and we recognize now that it's such an inflammatory response that causes vasodilation and these other markers to affect your organs and circulatory system that fluids just temporarily gets you better while the antibiotics are doing the background work. And so for some people, it's just more time from an antibiotics perspective. And um, a little bit like ARDS, Alessandra was mentioning, you can clear an infection very quickly. So if you check somebody's blood and it's um, bacteremic, for example, 48 hours later, they've usually cleared it, but they are not usually better. So the long-lasting effects of the damage that those organisms are doing from an inflammatory perspective is why the hypotension can linger way after the infection has gone. And so they're not really sure, but that's the physiology, I believe, behind it. Anything else? Okay, well, go along and help set this. <laughs> <laughs>